All right, we started off here in Job 32, and really, um, I'm not going to do any type of Bible study on this chapter. Um, Elihu, there's not a whole lot that he says in general in all these chapters that are right. The Bible explains that, that, that Job was right, God says Job was right, and his friends were wrong, and you know, I'm not going to get into all that, but there's one thing that's mentioned here kind of near the beginning. I'm going to reread some of these, these verses that we read that is at least indicative of the culture of the time. And there's, there's a few things that he said here that are right. There's some things that he said that are, that, that are true and right. I'm going to be focusing in on those things and show, just showing you some scriptures. And um, basically what I'm going to be preaching this morning is on respecting your elders and showing respect. And there's something that, that is something that is going completely down the tubes these days and not just with kids but with adults and with people in general not just respecting elders but just showing basic respect common courtesy manners things of this nature are just completely have gone by the wayside and and we're just degrading morally degrading spiritually just degrading as a country as a whole as a nation culturally, I mean, everything is just getting more and more base, more and more degraded and wicked and sinful. So I'm going to teach this morning on this subject. We're going to go through some biblical principles and a lot of scripture that just kind of promotes this. And I'm going to show you that even when it comes to things like having proper manners and good manners is scriptural. It's biblical. It's not just, oh, I don't know why they made all these, you know, people make up these rules to, to follow, you know, in social settings and things like that. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know why we have to do it. Well, there's a good reason for it. Okay, there's a good reason. It's, it basically boils down to how you treat other people and showing respect. And that is, almost, is all but lost today. So I think it's something that ought to be uh, covered. Let's, we'll cover it this morning. Job 32. Look at verse number two. Something that, that Elihu the way that he behaved and the way that he acted in, in this sense was correct that, that he basically what it is, he waited for people who were older than him to speak. He didn't interrupt. He let them do all their talking. He, he gave place to see if he could receive wisdom from people who were older than him. Okay, and look at, we're gonna read here in verse number two. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the kindred of Ram against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. When Elihu, excuse me, when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzi, answered and said, I am young and ye are very old, wherefore I was afraid and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. And we're going to stop there because this is what we're basically going to be focusing on. And you could turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19. So what he did was first, he let, you know, when you're reading through the book of Job up until the chapter 32, you have Job and his friends going back and forth, right? And his friends are condemning him. They're, they're, his friends are saying, you know, basically you're in some kind of sin. Otherwise, this stuff wouldn't be happening to you. And Job wasn't in sin, and God made that very clear. But they're going back and forth. They're trying to instruct Job with wisdom. And up until chapter 32, he didn't even realize that Elihu was there because he's not even mentioned. But he was there. He was kind of just, just taking everything in, hearing from Job, hearing from his three friends, hearing everything that's going on. And because he was younger, he waited. Now look, what the conclusion Elihu came up with was wrong. It's not right. It's established in the Bible because he ended up basically doing the same thing that the three friends did. And God rebuked the three friends. God rebuked Elihu. But the, the, the manner in which he went about waiting to speak was correct. And this is right. And this is something that people need to have. And children, you know, you need to understand this too. There is wisdom to be had. Look, there's wisdom that's just gained through experience that people will get, you will gain throughout your life. The older you get, 
you go through more things, you have more experiences, you deal with more stuff, you're going to learn more. Okay. That is a little bit different than the wisdom that you, you can gain by, by just delving into God's word and really reading and studying and just immersing yourself in God's word and gaining that type of wisdom. Now, when I say they're different, it's not like one is less true than the other. You, you know, your experiential wisdom, you can, well, my point is you can gain the experiential wisdom even through scripture because the, the, God's word has everything that we need to learn. But people learn these truths of the Bible on their own as you go through life, even being you know, unbelievers. It's still, a truth is a truth, right? Things that are right are right. Things that are true, they're true. You're going to learn that. You're going to see that. And as you grow older, you're going to experience that and you're going to know that. Now, this applies to spiritually as well as physically younger and have be, having a humble attitude and showing respect and waiting to hear before you speak. And kids need to learn this because kids have a tendency to be impulsive, right? And they, they think they understand everything in their minds when oftentimes they don't. We deal with this on a regular basis. But if the child is going to be wise and wants to be wise, kids, you need to learn to, to hold back, to withhold and let your parents speak. And, and it's folly to say, oh, my parents, they just don't know what they're talking about. Now, if what, you're, if what your parents are saying contradicts God's word and it's completely against the Bible, then they don't know what they're talking about. Because this is the ultimate wisdom that we have. But usually that's not the case. Usually what happens when any of this even comes up is it's, it's, it's experiential knowledge that they're basing it off of. I know, I, you know, I'm not very old, but I'm not super young either. At 40 years old, I've been through enough things and I've learned a lot just over the years of doing things, of being here on this earth, of going through problems, experiences, different things, fixing different things, whatever, all this different experiential knowledge that my children have not gone through at all. So when they want to do certain things and, you know, the parents tell them, no, you can't do that, you can't do this, and, and set up guidelines, set up rules, set up the way things are going to be, and explain, no, this is actually what's going to happen if we go here. We're not going to go there. We're not going to allow this to happen. They don't see the harm in many things. They don't see, you know, how could this be so bad because they're naive, because they're ignorant, because they haven't gone through things. Oftentimes, and I can't think of a specific example off the top of my head, but there are things that we've gotten ourselves into that we might have thought, hey, this isn't really that bad. This looks like it's kind of fun. Let's go out and do this. And then it turns out to actually be a big disaster because you didn't consider everything involved in it, you know, and you actually get yourself into trouble that you ought not get yourself into. I mean, a good example is, is just like just even going into, you know, bars where people are, are getting drunk. It's just not a wise thing to do. You say, oh, but you know, people are having fun there. I want to visit with family. I want to visit with friends. So I'm like, I'm not even going to go in there. The most recent thing, and, and I've already learned this partially through experience and, and, through, and through God's word, but when I went to my friend's um, funeral, when a close friend of mine died, and I went there, you know, a lot of people were hanging out in the bar and they're, doing, you know, they're drinking everything else. And I'm not going to be a part of that. No, these are people that I've known for a long time. They're part of my life. You know, I would consider them my friends, but I'm not going to go in and even be around that. Even if I'm, you know, like, of course I'm not going to drink, but you know what? Bad things happen in those places. When people are getting drunk, bad things happen. And even just being, even if you don't do those things, you know, you ever heard of a bar fight? You hear about bar fights way more often than you hear about church fights, right? <laughs> I mean, when's the last time you hear people, you know, throwing chairs at each other and, you know, throwing fists and everything when you go to church? It doesn't happen. And if it does happen, it's really, really bizarre and not normal at all. But would you really say it's abnormal to hear about a bar fight? Nope. To go into a place and there's, you know, people, look, people get hurt. People get shot. It's not a wise place to go. It's just, it's just something you're not going to do. And some things are more obvious than others, right? But as, as a, a young person or as a kid, you don't always realize these things. You don't know all of this truth and your parents or people are older than you do know these things. And me, as a, as a middle-aged man, there's a lot of things that I still don't know. There's a lot of experiences I still haven't had that people who are older than me have learned. 
And we need to appreciate that and respect that and respect people who have been through a lot more. Why? Because they ought to have a lot more wisdom and knowledge. People who have been on this earth longer ought to be wise and they ought to have knowledge and they ought to know a lot of things just because they've been around. Now, not everybody is. And that's another thing that Elihu said. He said, great men are not always wise. Great meaning like, you know, they're rich, they're powerful, or they're, you know, they're, they're in authority. They're not always wise. Now, should they be? Of course they should. But they're not, it's not always the case. Neither do the aged understand judgment. You can have a lot of old fools that are just completely foolish and that just didn't allow themselves to learn life's lessons. But when you deal with people on a social level, we're going to make the assumption that they are wise. You don't just assume that everyone you run into is a fool. You give them the benefit of the doubt and you treat people with the respect as such that, hey, here's an older person. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hold the door open for them. I'm going to let them go through. I'm going to say, yes, sir. And, you know, as the Bible says in Leviticus 19, if you're there, look at verse number 32. This isn't God's law, by the way. You talk about, man, oh, these old manners and these people behaving this way, and uh, I don't know why society has done these things. Well, Leviticus 19.32 says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. And that hoary means like white, light hair, like light color because of age. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. This isn't God's law. So I know people don't do this anymore. But it hasn't been that long removed since people used to obey God's law in this respect. When someone who's an older man comes in that has the white and gray hairs, when someone walks into the room, the, what you're supposed to do is you rise up. Why? To show respect for that person. You show respect when you stand up. You show respect to that person and you honor the face of the old man. Now turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. And people have a problem with this, oh, just going through the motions and having manners and stuff. Why do we need to have manners and stuff? I just want to be who I am, and I just want to be who I have to be, and I don't want to play this game, and I don't want to get caught up in this. This is what, the Bible, this is what God's Word says. This is what God is commanding us to do. He says, you rise up, you show respect, you respect other people. And you know, ultimately, it's just a proud and arrogant attitude that doesn't want to conform to actually having manners and respect for other people because they don't respect other people. They don't have humility. They're not willing to say, hey, I'm going to show respect unto someone else because I care about them, because I love them, because I'm going to treat people the way that I want to be treated. And if you want people to respect you, you better learn and learn quickly how to respect other people. Otherwise, you will have none. You could demand it all you want, but respect isn't something that's just people just give to you because it's demanded. Respect is something that's earned. Now, we ought to give respect, especially with people we don't know. Like I, was, I was saying, you know, we ought to just treat people the way we want to be treated and treat everybody with respect. But you can't, if you go around demanding respect, you're not going to get it. Proverbs 16, verse 31, the Bible says, the hoary head is a crown of glory. So it should be a good thing. And, you know, when I get old, I'll tell you one thing I'm never going to do. When I start getting the gray hairs, I'm not going to color or dye my hair. Okay, now men don't probably have as much of a problem with this, but even ladies, you know, when you start getting the gray hair and, and, and the white hair and things like that, don't be so caught up in the vanity of the color of your hair. It's actually, the Bible says it's a crown of glory, but there is a condition that says, if it be found in the way of righteousness. So if you're living a righteous life, if you're a godly person, those gray hairs that's actually a crown of glory. Why? Because you've made it so long in life and you're still running the race and you're still living a godly life. That is how, that is a crown of glory. And people will rec ought to recognize it as such. And people ought to show even more respect under the elderly people. And, you know, people that are coming, they're faithful to church, they've been coming for a long time, they, 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 they're, they're living a righteous life. Hey, 
don't be upset with those people when they're driving, you know, five miles an hour in front of you. Okay, like, like show some respect to these people. Yes, I know, it's not always easy. <laughs> But, but just don't worry about it. You know, when you're pulling the church and stuff, you don't need to run around them because they're walking slower getting to the door. That is disrespectful. You don't need to be just cutting right in front of them or just zooming around. Oh man, you're walking too slow. Why not wait for them, hold the door open for them and do what you can to help them through and show respect under the, you because know, you know, one day you're going to get old. Yeah, you feel real young right now and you're, you, you've got a lot of pep in your step and you're doing really good, but one day you're going to have problems. Everybody slows down. Your body's going to change whether you like it or not. And if you're going to want people to show respect unto you, why don't you start right now showing respect unto those older people? and doing what you can to help them out and rising up when they come in and, and, and doing all the things that, you know, maybe you heard way, way back in the day, but uh, seems to be forgotten these days. Don't get caught up and follow the multitude to do evil because today what the multitude is doing is evil. The multitude doesn't care. The majority of people don't care about those things anymore. And children especially need to be taught to have more respect and even basic manners in these days. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. And what do I mean by this? I mean the eye rolling. And the heavy sighing. This is not respectful, kids. It's not, res it's not respectful for adults to do it to other adults or to anyone. It's not respectful for the kids especially to be doing that to their parents. You know, when your parents tell you to do something you don't want to do, you don't go, oh. It's disrespectful. It is, okay? Your kids need to learn to hold that inside. Look, you may not be happy about things, but when you express that this could, oh man, we're having this for dinner, you do not respect the time, the effort, the care, the love, the preparation that went into your meal when you start voicing your discontent right. and you start murmuring and complaining and you want to learn about murmuring and complaining, kids, read the book of Exodus. Read how God feels about the children of Israel when they complained. And you can look at what they were fed. They were fed the same exact meal every single day for years, for decades. And you want to complain about not having all of your special sides or not having this topping or not, you know, you need to get right with God. Yes, even the kids. Right. And you know what? Adults that act this way, you get right with God. And parents, don't expect your kids to be having the proper manners and to be doing things right and, and to be respectful if you are not that way. You need to be the example. It's one thing for the kids to hear this is the right way. It's another thing what they see at home and what they see you do, the way they see you interact with other people. That's where they're going to get their most learning from. When they see you not being thankful for what you have, when they see you having a, a complaining attitude, when they see you rolling your eyes, when someone who has authority over you tells you to do something. And I'll tell this to the wives, to the, to the mothers, the Bible says that the husband is the head of the household. What do you think your kids are going to do to you when you roll your eyes, when you talk back to your husband, when you do all the things that you don't want your kids doing to you? What do you think they're going to do when you act that way to your husband who is your authority in the household? Just keep that in mind. This isn't just for the kids. This is for everybody. Because the way that you behave, hey, that's going to show on the kids. And that's going to be a dishonor and a disgrace unto the mothers for raising their children that way. When your kids have no respect for you, it's probably because you have no respect for other people in your life. We need to, as a society, as a people, need to, to learn more respect. And these things are prevalent. I mean, you see the kids these days all with their eye roll, you know, and it's kind of comical, but you know what? It's not. It's actually kind of sad because you see it so often. There's serious problems. Now, on the surface, it may seem kind of minor. It might not seem like it's that big of a deal, right? Oh, well, just, he, he rolled his eyes, ha ha, it's kind of funny. You know, she did this, yeah, it's, it's, it's cute. But it's not, because this, this is underlying of a much more serious problem. 
the, the way children behave themselves, and especially in public, and the way they interact with others is only going to get worse unless they're taught otherwise, unless they're, 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 they're instructed repetitively how to behave. Because if they're left to themselves, they're going to bring their mothers to shame and they're not going to know how to behave at home or in public. And just, just proving it, this manners and the way that we deal with people is in Scripture. Matthew 7, verse 12, Jesus said, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Amen. It's treating other people with it's treating other people the way that you would want to be treated. Right. So if you want people listening to what you have to say, if you want people not mocking you and not ridiculing you or not complaining about everything you say, then why don't you be the way that you want people to treat you. And that's what basic manners is. That's what res showing respect is. It's, it's treating other people the way that you would want to be treated. Very simple. It's a very simple concept. And parents need to be very careful what you allow your children to be influenced by. Because there's a lot of influences out there and a lot of them seem to be harmless. And again, this is, a, this is another area where a lot of kids don't understand they don't understand the experiential wisdom and the biblical wisdom that their parents should have that they don't. The cartoons, the, the, the children's programming, that's out there. You could say, oh, well, there's nothing just overtly wicked in this, right? There's nothing that's just, you know, this is, you know, there, there's fornication going on or adultery or drunkenness, right? You can look at it and say, oh, well, none of that's happening. But what is being taught and trained by the regular occurrences in these cartoons and these videos or whatever? What's going on there? Uh, an a good example I could think of is that we don't really read the, you know, the Berenstein Bears. That was something that was around when I was a kid. And until we had kids of our own, and, and I have a rule where you know, we need to read everything or watch anything or whatever we're going to do before we show our children, because I don't want them just, just oops, oh, well, we didn't know what was in this, and now all of a sudden they've already been exposed to it, and it's, you know, whatever. And even things that I recognize as a kid, because I had these books read to me and stuff, but even with that, you could say, oh, this is, you know, you're splitting hairs, Pastor Burson. This isn't that big of a deal. But one of the things I've noticed in those books is that they treat the dad as an imbecile. The mother is the one who's in charge of the whole house. And the dad is just a big doofus. He's just an oaf. He's, he's kind of a, a stupid man that, does, that just kind of does whatever his wife says and, do, and, and is always just causing problems. And you know what? It seems kind of comical. Oh, it's kind of funny. But I don't want my kids just learning from this. This is how family life is. This is, you know, it's like dad's dumb and mom's in charge and this is the way things run. I'm not going to have them get that type of influence. And it may be subtle, but these things are out there. I'm not going to have my kids learning from that and just, just having them influenced by that. And then they see the way the kids interact with their dad because dad's kind of stupid and they laugh at him and tease him and make jokes about him and stuff. That's not going to happen in my household. And it's even worse. And, and that's, look, that's a really mild example of what kids are exposed to. Okay? <laughs> if that's the worst thing you have going as an influence in your kid's life, you're doing pretty good. If that is like the worst. But these days, what do kids have? They've got the movies, they've got the rock and roll and the, the hip hop and the, this culture that's just against all authority, that is vulgar and nasty and just degenerate and teaching a rebellious spirit and just a hedonistic lifestyle of just whatever feel good, feels good, do it. Women and drugs and money and, and rock and roll and, and you know, all this stuff that kids are allowed to have, that the parents just let their kids listen to this music, watch these types of movies, and it is destroying our culture. And I mean, look, you think about the attitudes that they have and the language that's being used, and there is no respect. I'm sorry, the, the, the rock and roll industry, hip hop, all the popular culture, there is no respect for anybody in that stuff. It's all about me, 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 and four letter word, everybody else. Right. Cuss out everyone. I don't care about anyone else. I'm going to walk all over people to me, see myself advance. That's what music industry is about. 
And that's where your kids are going to be taught if you allow them to listen to this garbage. The garbage, any, look, and what's the garbage music? Anything that's popular, anything that's out on the radio today, it's garbage. I don't even have to have heard it. Why? Because I have enough experiential wisdom and knowledge to know that it's all garbage. I don't care what it is. If it's of the world, it's not of the Father. Right. And that filthy language, this is, again, people say, oh, well, it's just a word. What's the big deal about a word? Well, one, the Bible says in Colossians 3.8, Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Colossians 3, 8 says, But now ye also put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. So why do you care about the words people use? Well, the Bible says that we ought not to have filthy communication out of your mouth. Now, what's more filthy? You think about some of the four-letter words you've heard. What are they about? They're about filthy things. That's right. It's filthy language. It's filthy communication out of your mouth. And we're starting to hear that in kids younger and younger and younger these days. I just took my daughters out ice skating recently. And we were just waiting in line. And it's like, it's a family thing. I mean, this is a family town. It's family, families going to go ice skating. I've got my little girls, my, my youngest girls in line with me who are four and six years old. And we're waiting to get our skates. And there's a couple of, I assume, teenage girls behind us and they're dropping F-bombs. And it's like, I've got a four and six-year-old daughter right here, and they don't even care, and they're just loud and obnoxious, loud women, young girls, you know, and they're, they're going out and they're speaking this way and, and using language. I mean, I would never think about you, especially when I was that age. Like, you know, there's some things that, that people would say some people might say in private or among friends, but you don't go out in public and say a lot of those things. And I'm not saying it's right to say those things even in private. Like these words just should not even be spoken. But they're out in public around little kids. And, you know, and I turned around and I was like, do you want to watch your mouth? And I got them to shut up and not use that language anymore because I actually said so. You know, people need to say things a little bit more when this is going on, so that doesn't just continue and you're just afraid to say anything or correct any problem that's going on. But look, I'm responsible for my kids and I don't want them to have that type of an influence, so I'm going to say something about it. But even the kids, are, you know what the root of the problem is though? Because I heard them later on still just you know, murmuring to themselves and, and, you know, and, and mocking and saying things. Like, look, I don't care if they want to ridicule me and not show any respect to me, but you know what? They're not going to say that, be using that language around my kids. I'm not going to put up with it. And, and, you know, and they did. And I don't know everything they say because I didn't care. I wasn't trying to eavesdrop on their conversation. But when they're standing right behind you and they're being real loud and they're using all these curse words, unacceptable. And you know who really gets to shame in that? Their parents. Shame on them and shame on their parents. Now, teenagers, you're old enough. You ought to be able to, to know what's appropriate. And I'll tell you what's not appropriate. When you have little kids around you using the most vulgar language that you could possibly use. That's not appropriate. That's a shame. It's disrespectful. And, and shame on the parents that aren't doing their jobs. And you know what, though? The parents of kids like that, they'd probably come and curse me out for telling them not to say those things. And that's where the problem ultimately lies. Now, I don't know them. I don't know if that would happen, but I know there's lots of people like that. I've seen people like that where they use that language at home like it's no big deal. And if you want a sure way for people not to respect you, go ahead and just start using all the filthy language. Because I'll tell you what, I don't respect people that use that language. You could be making the best point in the world and you start using all these, these four-letter words and you know what? My respect is just, you know, my, my listening is just going to stop. Why? Because you sound like a fool. You may not be a fool, but you sound just like a fool. Why? Because the fools are out using that language. I don't want to be, I don't want to be a fool. Oh, it's just a word. Well, all words have meaning. I mean, you could say all kinds of things. All words have meaning. And you, you want to use that, oh, it's just a word. Well, the word Jesus is a word. You say, oh, Jesus is just a word. Or God's a word. Well, the Bible says not to use his name in vain. I mean, 
Why? Because there's a meaning there. You don't just drop the name of the Lord or, or Jesus Christ. You know, people get mad and, oh, Jesus Christ. What's the big deal? It's just a word. Well, words carry meaning, and the Bible says not to do that. And the Bible says not to have filthy communication coming out of your mouth. So we all watch what you say. And I don't care if you're in the blue collar section and, well, that's what everyone else, the way everyone else talks. You know what? God called you to be peculiar, to be different. You don't need to be using that language that everybody else uses. You don't need to become a fool like them. Why don't you use something that's upright and respectable and language that can be used that, that it doesn't matter who's listening to you? That's the type of language that we ought to have. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. See, this is to be expected. We know these types of things are going to happen. 2 Timothy 3, verse number 1, the Bible reads, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And it goes on and on and on, talking about not, without natural affection and things like that. But one of the things that this is disobedient to parents. Kids are going to be more and more out of control. They'll be more and more disobedient and rebellious and stubborn. And it's not a surprise when you look at the culture and you see what's promoted and you see the pop stars, you see the musicians, you see the movies, you see everything that's being promoted to the kids is disobey, disobey. You know, don't worry about authority. You know, do everything you can to rebel and do what feels good for you. That is what they're being taught. And it's, and it's turning us into a degraded, wicked filthy society. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. And don't allow yourself to become desensitized to these things either. The bad manners, the filthy communication, all these other things. Don't allow yourself to be desensitized to that. It ought to vex you. It ought to bother you. It ought to trouble you. And, and especially enough for you not to be involved in those things, but also to rebuke people when they need to be rebuked. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 6, the Bible says, "...and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and deliver just Lot." Now, this is talking about Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. He was vexed. Like, he was living in, in Sodom, but he was vexed. Why? Because he was saved. Because he knew that those things were wrong. And he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now, Lot, was, I believe, was spineless. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't go out. He didn't preach God's word. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. Yes, his soul was vexed, but he just lived this vexed life. And if you live in Sodom, you know, get out of there. If your soul is just vexed every single day with the unlawful deeds, you know what? It, maybe it's time to go somewhere else, especially if it's a place like Sodom. But in order to preserve a place like that, because the Bible does say, you know, that had these things been done in Sodom that were done here, in reference to the miracles and the things that Jesus was doing and the preaching he was doing, is they would have remained unto this day because they were repented. Now, it wouldn't have, Sodom would not have repented. And people want to throw this out there of saying, see, Sodomites could be saved because the Bible says if these things have been done in Sodom, you know, then they would have remained unto this day. Except, you know what? It wouldn't have been saved the day that the angels came in to destroy it. It wouldn't have been saved on that day. If Jesus Christ had shown up, because guess what? The Bible talks about the Son of, the Son of God speaking with Abraham with the two angels. He didn't go in there to perform the miracle so that they could repent and be saved. He went in there just to see, wow, things really are this bad. Obviously, there's a point where things could have changed and turned around for Sodom. By the time that God was going to pour out his judgment, it was already past that point and it was too late. So maybe when Lot first got involved, in Sodom, when he pitched his tent towards them, had he been preaching, you know, it would have remained. Had he been doing what's right, because he only needed 10 people, 10 righteous people, and the whole city would have been spared. But that didn't happen. Because Lot wasn't doing his job. And we need to be doing, you know, you can be vexed, but say something, do something. 
speak up. Lot didn't speak up. He allowed things to continue and continue and continue, and he stayed there and, until everything went really, really bad. Proverbs chapter 30. Uh, you could turn it if you like. Proverbs chapter 30. These things are happening in these last days and they're going to happen and we need to do our best to make sure that they don't happen because it's wicked and, and it's not right. We need to stand up for what's right. I'm not surprised to see these things happening, but let's do our best to, to, to live righteously and do what's right and to, to hold these things off. We don't, we don't know exactly when the day or hour is going to be. We can see things happening around us, but I don't know if it's going to be next week, next year. Or not, no, it's not going to be next week. I don't know if it's going to be in the next 20 years, 50 years, 100, maybe the next 100 years for all I know. Let's try to, to, to do our best to be the light to shine, to show the right way, to get people back, to get people repent, to get people to do the right things. That's our job. This is what we ought to be doing. Not throwing up our hands and say, well, this is the end time. This is just the way it's going to be. No, it's not. If nothing else, do it for your children's sake. They can see the right way and they can grow up to be respectful people and they can grow up respecting others and showing the right way in their lives. Proverbs 30 verse 11 says, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. And, and again, I think this is indicative. A lot of things are going on today that, that you can see if we're not completely here yet, we're going that way. The, this generation, it's a group of people, the generation of people that curse their father, do not bless their mother. They don't care about their parents. They don't respect their parents. They don't respect anyone. They're pure in their own eyes. They think they're great. They, oh, we're righteous. We're doing everything right. And yet they're not washed from their filthiness. God's saying they're filthy. They think they're righteous, but they're really filthy. They're really wicked. Verse 13, there is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes. They're full of pride. Well, yeah, we could have gathered that just from cursing their father and not blessing their mother. They're proud. They're not humble. They're not showing respect. And their eyelids are lifted up. There's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. What a bunch of wicked people. But look at those attributes. They don't have respect because they're proud, because they curse their parents, and because they're just right in their own eyes. That's what pride will get you. We need to instill good manners and instill good respect into our children so that they don't become like this. They're not part of this generation, so that they could be humble. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. I just want to bring this up real quickly about, you know, the title of my sermon is Respect Your Elders, because... Physically speaking, we ought to be respecting people who are older than us. Elders, children ought to be showing respect to, to not only their parents, but to other people. You know, my kids ought not to only be showing respect unto me. They ought to respect everybody that comes in here. They ought not to be talking down or, or talking in a way that's disrespectful to any adult in this church or even to any of their peers. They ought to be treating everybody with respect. I ought to be treating it. You ought to be treating everyone with respect. This is the way that the culture ought to be within these four walls and apply that continuing out in your life as well. But not just physically speaking because the Bible refers to elders as also spiritual elders. So in the Bible, you know, an elder could be, would be a pastor or a bishop, right? These words are used interchangeably to de describe an office. And the respect that we ought to have for an elder of the church is very similar respect that you ought to have for other elders. It's very, I mean, showing respect is common courtesy, but there's something about the office of an elder or a bishop that also does demand respect. And it, because it is, I, know, I mean, think about I ought to respect you, you ought to respect me just as, as people, right? Just say outside of church, just in general, you go out somewhere, you ought to show respect for people. That ought to happen, but how much more should your children respect you, right? Even more than the respect that you show to just random people on the street, your children ought to have that respect for you that ought to be higher. The respect that they have for you as parents ought to be higher than everybody else. Why? Because 
They're, the parents are in the authority. The parents are, are raising and, and helping and doing things for the kids. That ought to gain even more respect. So in the like manner, when we're talking about uh, spiritually, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5 verse 1, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. Now, I believe this is primarily talking about physically because it talks about the elder, rebuke not an elder, retreat him as father, and then it talks about the younger, okay? But this also can completely be applied spiritually as well because we all have spiritual ages. You know, we're all, you know, when you get born, when you're born again, that's a new life. That's a new birth. You're a babe in Christ. You're a baby, okay? So the things that you know as a babe in Christ is nothing compared to people who have been around for a long time, who've been studying God's word, who know doctrine, who know, you know, the things that are right. Spiritually, they're much more mature. They're older. They're elder. And you may be physically an older person, but you need to be able to learn to show the respect to those that spiritually are even more mature. The way that our children learn, physically speaking, younger kids, they need to learn a lot. They, there's a lot of experiential knowledge that we gain from anyone that's older than them. Any adult ought to be able to teach children stuff from life, life lessons. Well, spiritually speaking, people who are older spiritually should be able to teach younger you know, babes in Christ things as well. And we need to recognize because, because we have the physical realm, you can be physically older and spiritually a babe. And that's going to require even more humility on your part to be someone who's achieved a level just physically of receiving respect because you're older. Maybe you have a whore head, but you just got saved, right? That's going to require more humility to be able to learn from somebody who's spiritually older. Maybe your pastor's like in his late 20s or something, right? And physically a lot younger. But spiritually, you know, man, he's really poured in a lot and has learned a lot and knows his Bible, has memorized his Bible, and has done all this work for the Lord and spiritually knows a lot and has a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge. You're going to need to humble yourself to say, I'm going to learn from this person and show respect unto that person, even though you may be way older than them, physically speaking. Showing that respect. Look at verse number 17. Uh, just, just to show, this isn't just talking about physical um, elders. Verse 1, you know, I, I believe is applied both ways. Rebuke not an elder. Hey, you know, uh, and treat him as a father. That shows respect. And it's not saying don't ever tell them they're, you know, you can't say they're wrong, but it's how you do it. He says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. You know, it's wicked. It's wicked for me to just go about rebuking my parents. Am I saying I've never done that? No, but I, I ought not to have that attitude. You know, I ought to entreat them and show them respect as my parents. I could tell them they're wrong. You know, I could, I could preach the truth. I could do what's right. But it doesn't mean that, I, that you have to go around in dishonoring people or disrespecting them in the way that you do it, when, especially when there's people who have that authority over you that, that, that demand that respect because of their position. Verse number 17, look at the wording here. The Bible says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. This is obviously talking about, spiritually speaking, this is about elders in the church. At this point in the chapter, verse 17, let the elders that rule well. Why? Because the elder is appointed, or the bishop is appointed as someone who's, going to, who's ruling in the house of God. They're a bishop, they're pastoring, they're they're watching over the flock. They're in charge. There's a position that God has given in the church for a man to be in charge so that there's one direction. Now, ultimately, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. But there needs to be, humanly speaking, somebody you know, administering and, and watching over and taking care of things in the church. And that's the position of the elder or the pastor. 
and the elder rules in the church. It says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Hey, if someone's ruling well, if someone's doing a good job within the church, they're doing a good job of following Jesus Christ, they're doing a good job of watching over the flock and doing their job and doing the things that they're supposed to be doing and they rule well, the Bible says, let them be worthy of double honor. Show them even more respect. Show them even more. Give them double honor, especially they who labor. They're working hard in the word and doctrine. They really care about what's right. They're teaching the truth from God's word. Let them be worthy of double honor. And I've preached this before. I'm not going to go into it in depth. But honor isn't just referring to respect, um, especially in this context, because he says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. This is talking about caring for and, and you know, taking care of the pastor that's working really hard. And it's talking about him, his physical well-being, right? Being able to eat food, you know, financially, whatever, just that, that he's being taken care of. And hey, if he's working really hard, then he's worthy of that reward. Like, you know, some people say, oh, the pastor shouldn't get paid. Nonsense. Yeah. Nonsense. Of course they should. Of course it's a paid position. Of course it's something that someone who's dedicating their life to do all this stuff and to watch other people, of course it's a paid position. And this is one of the verses that you could use to prove that. The laborer is worthy of his reward. You can't muzzle the ox. Look, the ox is the one doing all the work, right? And this is talking about an ox who's stamping corn into powder, right? So you could get that cornmeal and using an animal to do that. You saying you don't muzzle the ox. You let him, you know, he's doing all of the work. Let the ox, you know, take a few bites of the food so that he could, you know, that, that he could keep going. Well, it, it's the, the analogy is being used. Hey, the pastor's doing all this work. They're working really hard. They're putting in all this time and effort and energy and, and trying to make sure everything's going. Let him be taken care of. Make, you know, make it so that he doesn't have to go out and get another job in order to feed himself and to feed his family and do everything else. He ought to be able to focus just on one thing. And I know, you know people here don't have that problem. Everyone's, everyone's been great here. But this is what the Bible's teaching. This is what the Bible says. And this is why I feel I finally started, you know, as we've grown enough, to receive some, some reward for, for the work that I've been doing as a pastor. Because it's right. Because it's what the Bible teaches. And it's going to help me to not have to do as much work outside of here. And I could focus more and more my time here. And then it says, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So again, you know, people can't just be throwing out accusations. You need to have some, you know, some seriously like witnesses and people to be able to testify, no, this is true. Otherwise, no one should be accepting it at all. If someone's going around spreading rumors, oh, Pastor Burson's did this, Pastor Burson's this. Look, if you don't have witnesses, then you either keep your mouth shut. And if you hear about those things, you know, you don't receive that accusation. And don't start thinking, oh, well, maybe this is true. So-and-so said this or so-and-so said that. You need to have witnesses that are going to testify and say, no, no, this is, this is actually what happened. Because it's a serious matter. And especially against an elder. It's, it, it's, it's putting an elder, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, spreading rumors about anybody. But there's a reason why it's bringing a point about against an elder. As opposed to just against anybody. Again, as an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin, rebuke before all that others also may fear. And this is the consequence of people who are spreading rumors and stuff when they're trying to bring something against an elder. If it's found out they don't have witnesses or found out that they're in sin, then you rebuke them before all. That everyone needs to know, hey, these people are lying and it's public and they're going to be shamed for, before everybody and rebuked before everybody so that other people who might want to come up with some false accusation might fear a little bit before they go out and do such a thing. Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 13. We're almost done. Hebrews chapter 13. I just want to drive this point home because the Bible says, you know, let the elders that rule well, and it uses that word rule because they're ruling. Hebrews 13, verse number 7, the Bible says, Remember them which have the rule over you. And it's going to clarify who he's talking about. Those that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. This is talking about a spiritual leader. This is, and who would this be talking about? An elder. Them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And then in verse 17, the Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls. Because that is the job of the pastor, of the elder. They're watching for your souls. 
That's my job, my function, my part. I'm supposed to be looking at the people in this congregation and watching out for them and watching out for your souls. And if I see some, some bad influences coming, I see some problems coming, it's my job to try to correct that. It's my job to try to make sure, hey, everyone that, that's here, that's in this block, is going to be taken care of. Is not going to get, you know, carried away and just, just pulled off into the world. Because, you know, the Bible uses these words like pastor, like a pastor of a sheep you know, of a flock. And what happens to a flock? Well, wolves come in. They try to, try to yank them out. They try to destroy. They, you know, sheep wander off and just get lost out in the wilderness. The pastor's job, the person who's watching over that, is, is their job is trying to keep, thing, hey, keep everybody in here, you know, watch out for them, protection, right? And giving wisdom and knowledge. Now, the Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. The job of the pastor is, is one that's, is, that should be profitable for you because he's looking out for you. It's someone who's, who's saying, you know what, my job is to watch out and make sure that everybody's doing them as they can and not, and not getting you know, backslidden and getting out and, and everything else. That's my job. And I need to give account. And when someone takes that position of a bishop, that is their responsibility. So it's my responsibility, and I need to give account to God. So I can, you know, people don't get involved with, with if you have a desire to pastor a church one day or anything like that, don't do it for the wrong reasons and understand everything that the job entails because when you do step into that position, God's going to hold you responsible for what he said the job is. So if the job is looking out for people, and I have to give an account to God. God says, well, hey, what, what happened to this person? What happened to that person? What happened? Why did you let them go? That's something that falls on my shoulders. And having this, the reason why I'm even bringing this up is having this understanding of the pastor's job hopefully will help you to have more respect and show more honor and be a little bit more humble so when the pastor says things especially maybe that offend you or things that you don't like to hear you know maybe you could remember that they're looking out for you at least they should be i mean if they're doing their job right they should be but when you know that and you realize that and you can remember that then you could be like oh, okay well this is part of his job to to you know and I, I try not to get too involved in people's lives because I don't want to be a micromanager. The Bible doesn't say I'm supposed to do that, right? I'm not just telling everybody what you do in every single facet of your life and you tell me what you're doing here, here. No, no. But the things that I see and the things that, I, that are going on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to bring those up and to, and, and to say, hey, look, this, is, you know, this isn't right or I'll preach sermons on it or whatever because I need to give an account to God and, um, and it's supposed to be profitable for you. The pastor or the elder has been tasked with a difficult job. You know, children ought to respect their father at home because he's watching out for them. He's protecting them. He's doing things for them. And uh, we ought to respect our pastors because they're tasked with watching out for the flock. I'm just going to quote for you from Jeremiah chapter 3. We're done. You don't have to turn there. Jeremiah 3.14 says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Again, just showing one of the job of a pastor. Hey, he's supposed to be feeding you. You know, as, as a father of my family, I feed my children. I go out and work and provide for them so that they could be fed, and they ought to respect me for that. Why? Because I'm taking care of them. I'm providing for them. I'm the one that's working hard. I'm the one that's earning this money, and I am using this money to provide for them, to give them food. They ought to respect that. They didn't have to do anything for that. I'm doing it for them. In like manner, there ought to be respect for your pastor who's providing you with knowledge, who's, who's reading and studying this Bible and staying up late and getting up early and pouring over this and making sure, hey, what I say, I need to be right. It needs to be true. I need to provide wisdom. I need to, be not, to provide knowledge. We need to go through this book and I'm going to find all the places where the Bible talks about these subjects and I'm going to present them here to you and I'm going to feed you with this. Amen. People ought to respect that. Unfortunately, people come into the church saying, oh, what are you going to do for me? 
I've done a lot for you already. You just don't even realize it. You're just not even recognizing what's been done for you. But show the respect. And look, I'm not up here trying to say, oh, respect me, respect me, respect my position, respect my authority. Look, that's, that's not the attitude. Hopefully you all realize that's not the spirit that I have. But this is a biblical truth. And just because I'm the pastor doesn't mean I'm not going to preach on this because, oh, this has to do with me. Oh, this has to do with an elder. No. I'm going to preach all of God's word. And this is what the Bible says. And I thank God that we have a great church. And I, and I don't feel personally like anybody has shown, you know, any disrespect or anything here. I just, it, it goes hand in hand, though, the, the respect in every aspect of our life respecting you know, church leadership, respecting leadership at home, respecting other people, just being humble, not being proud, not being lifted up. It's a, great, it's a big problem. It's something that, that we need to deal with, and the best way to deal with it is for you to do what's right. You live the way it's right. You live a life of respectful, and, and don't, don't be silent, especially you know, when, when you got a bunch of kids, especially with kids, don't let kids out in public just run all over you as an adult. They need to be rebuked. If they're not getting the rebuke at home, then you go ahead and give them the rebuke. We saw last week, you know, about, you know, in Leviticus 19 about loving your neighbor and, and you know, um, rebuking them and not, and not allowing sin upon them, right? These kids don't know any better. You know what? Someone needs to tell them. Hopefully it's not too late. Hopefully someone can get them straight. Now, I'm not going to be their parent, but if I, if I hear stuff that's just unacceptable, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to keep quiet about it. And you know what? If you hear something out of my kids' mouths that's unacceptable, you rebuke them for it. Now, I'd like to know about it, but... I mean, especially when the parents are around. Now, don't do... You know, when the parents are around... These are kids that are out in public, and there's no parents around. But, like... If I'm standing right there, you don't need to, to rebuke my child when I'm in hearing of what they're saying. Okay, that's kind of stepping over some lines. <laughs> I won't do that to you. You show the same respect. You raise your kids the way that you're going to raise your kids. But when you let them off and no one's around and the kids are showing disrespect unto you, you correct them. They need correction. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for... Um, all the instruction and righteousness that your word provides to us, dear Lord. Pray that you please help us um, to be humble, to respect other people, to, to not let that culture of respect die, because especially when it's coming from your words, dear Lord, help us to do what's right, help us to um, respect our elders, respect the people who have authority over us, and um, Lord, we, we love you and we thank you for these truths. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.